Hello, my name is Pierre Bowden. Today is September the 28th, 2013. We're here at Prince George's Community College, Lago, Maryland, recording for Congresswoman Donna Edwards. Uh, we have here U.S. Navy Captain Richard Bryant. Thank you for coming, sir. Good morning. Hey, how you doing, sir? Good. All right. Um, just want to start off with a basic history of yourself, uh, where you was born, and just, you know, just some background of yourself, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Richard R. Bryant. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, from the Midwest. Um, I uh, attended the United States Naval Academy, and I graduated, graduated in 1988. And I joined the Navy as an officer, and I served in the submarine force, which is kind of a unique uh, branch of our military. Uh, and I did that for 23 years and just retired in the 2011 time frame. Okay, okay. Well, um, just, you know, let's go a little further back in time. Um, was you raised single home? Did you, you know, mom and dad was in the house with you? Or? Well, uh, my parents uh, divorced when I was three years old, and I spent time living between, uh, with my mother in St. Louis and my father in Indianapolis. I, uh, growing up in the Midwest, uh, one of the things uh, that people probably don't realize these days is that you had local TV stations, and the local TV stations uh, usually you have one that was a VHF station and one that was a UHF station, but the programming on those stations oftentimes uh, played a lot of old movies. So you had a lot of Laurel and Hardy, you had a lot of Abbott and Costello, and they also had a lot of uh, old uh, black and white World War II movies. Okay. And uh, so I grew up kind of watching a lot of the different movies that were made that documented the, the, the things that were done in uh, World War II, and uh, that kind of instilled in me a desire to serve in our military. Uh, that's where that came from. Okay, and you say you did U.S. Navy, correct? I did. All right, and did you want to expand on um, when did you get enlisted? Well, I uh, graduated from high school in 1984, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, like I said, I uh, was accepted at the United States Naval Academy, which is located here in uh, Annapolis, Maryland. It's a four-year institution uh, which uh, prepares uh, what you call the students at the Naval Academy midshipmen, uh, prepares the midshipmen to either enter the service as uh, an officer in the Navy or an officer in the Marine Corps. Now, the funny thing about uh, coming from the Midwest, you might say to yourself, well, how does a guy from the Midwest where there isn't a lot of water around decide that he wants to go into the Navy? Mm -hmm. Well, um, you can do a lot of th different things in the Navy. You can drive ships, obviously. Uh, you can fly in planes. And being from the Midwest, aviation was kind of a big, uh, big industry. It was, uh, you know, so when I first came to the Naval Academy, my, my concept of what I was going to do was going to fly in planes. Uh, because I didn't have 20-20 vision, I would have to be kind of what we call a backseater guy, a navigator or a naval flight officer. But my intention was to study aerospace engineering and to become a naval flight officer in the Navy. So did you know how to swim before you got inside the Navy? Actually, I did. I was lucky. Um, I, I, I should, should, you asked me earlier if I grew up with siblings. Well, from my, orig from my parents, I am the only child of that marriage. I do have a half-sister who's about 16 years my junior. Um, and, uh, and so as a result, growing up as a single kid, I was, uh, had the opportunity to do a lot of different activities. Uh, and one of them was to learn how to swim. Now, granted, it wasn't great swimming, <laughs> but you know, believe it or not, there are people who show up to the Naval Academy who don't, don't know how to swim. swim very well. I mean, really at all. Um, but it's not a requirement. They don't make you go and do a swimming test before they accept you to the Naval Academy. It's kind of taken on, I guess, taken on faith that you probably know how to swim or you could probably figure it out. Uh -oh. and, and believe it or not, uh, one of the graduation requirements, uh, we have to take uh, physical education uh, throughout our time there. And uh, it's a lot of things. If you ever watch Star Trek, and they talk about Starfleet Academy. It's kind of very similar to that. Okay. So, you know, we do fencing, we do judo, we do boxing, we do wrestling, and we do gymnastics. We do all these, like, kind of things. And one of the big things we do is swimming. Oh. And uh, our first class year, our senior year at the Naval Academy, we're required to do what's called the 40-year swim. Okay. And this uh, involves you wearing a, uh, a flight suit. 
and boots and you have a flight helmet and you have to basically stay afloat for 40 minutes with all that gear on. Mm. And, uh, and you, you do some swimming, you do some floating, you do what we call drown proofing where you just kind of, you know, float in the water, you take a breath, float in the water. And so it's, it's kind of to prepare you for uh, in the event, if, if, since we are a water-centric service, mm -hmm. uh, that if you had to do that, that you would have the basics to uh, help with your survival uh -huh. in, those, in those cases. Well, um, let's just expand a little bit more on your specialties and far as in what special training had you had while you was in Well, the as I pointed out earlier, I served in the submarine force, which is kind of a unique thing. Um, and submarines, uh, obviously, you know, most people have some concept of what a submarine is, whether it's the yellow submarine by the Beatles or it's a toy submarines that you see in cartoons, but, but fundamentally a submarine is a, a vessel that is able to submerge underneath the water and travel. Um, the submarine force was uh, created in the United States about 1900 uh, by a gentleman by, na uh, by the name of Holland and uh, we grew from there and then World War I and World War II uh, submarines played a pretty significant uh, role in those wars. Uh, if you remember how World War II started for the United States, you had the bombing of Pearl Harbor, Harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, which resulted in the loss, a significant loss of the Pacific Fleet. Uh, and so all the big ships, the battleships, the destroyers, the frigates, they were all kind of out of commission. But one thing that kind of survived that whole mess was the submarine force. So when the United States immediate immediate response to the bombing at Pearl Harbor was to deploy the submarine force against Japan. And uh, a pretty storied and uh, remarkable history of the submarine force and what it did in World War II for the United States. But fundamentally, the submarine force held the line while the United States uh, sought about repairing those battleships and, and all the ships that were damaged in the bombing at Pearl Harbor. Uh, submarines have grown over the years. In the 1950s, we shifted from uh, diesel-powered submarines. And a lot of people, well, how do you run a diesel underneath water? Well, you don't. Um, the way it works is when a submarine is able to actually get access to air through a snorkel mast or it's actually on the surface like a normal surface ship, like a, like a ship, uh, you can run the diesels. Okay. When it's submerged and you don't have access to the air for the combustion engine, you have to run on batteries. So what happens is, you run the diesels to charge the batteries when the batteries are charged and you shut down the diesels and you can button up the ship so no water comes in. You can submerge and you can go forward on those. Well, in 1950s, we we, we in the 1950s, we discovered uh, that we could actually apply nuclear power uh, to be the propulsion for our submarines. And so the Nautilus was born. It was the first nuclear submarine. Okay. Uh, and... Um, the beauty of that, of that was that you never needed air mm -hmm. to make the engines run. Uh, so the beauty of that is that a submarine theoretically could stay submerged forever, forever. because right. it never needed the surface to recharge its batteries. And uh, that was a significant player in what we now call the Cold War, okay. which was between the United States and Russia, then Russia, or correction, then the USSR, uh, and that is the world that I played in okay. predominantly. When I graduated from the, from the Naval Academy in 1988, uh, we were still in the Cold War. Uh, this was before the USSR dissolved and became what we now know as the Federated uh, Russian States. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, a big player in that Cold War was nuclear submarines, and why is that? Well. Once we figured out that we could keep submarines submerged for a very long time, uh, we then said, well, what happens if we put missiles on those submarines? Well, the beauty of a submarine or the natural, the natural, the benefit of being in a submarine, it's its stealth, its ability to be covert, the, its ability to not be able to be seen uh -huh. for the most part, That's right. right? So uh, this provided the submarine as a platform that was capable of launching nuclear submarines and, or correction, that was capable of launching nuclear missiles uh, where, say, the Soviet Union couldn't find them. Okay, okay. Because 
like the United States, the Soviet Union also had what we call intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles that were on land. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, other advances in technology, satellite photography and imagery, it was kind of like, well, if we know where their missiles are, then we can always probably destroy them destroy. before they use them against mm -hmm. us. But if we have these missiles on a submarine that's somewhere out in the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean and you don't know where they are, well, that changes the complexion of... The element of surprise. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, what, what, what set about was this concept called nuclear deterrence. So in the Cold War, the thing that prevented the United States and the USSR from actually having a war was the fact that we could assure mutual destruction. When you add this other piece with regards to submarines and missiles, and now you don't know where they are exactly, then that equation gets a little sketchy. Okay. okay, because now it's like, I don't know if we can assure mutual destruction. We might destroy those missiles, but we don't know where those missiles are that are at sea. Mm -hmm. So you had two types of submarines. You had the, the submarines with the missiles on them, mm -hmm. And like, fleet ballistic missile submarines, and then you had the submarines that would theoretically hunt them down and get them, and that was the fast attack submarine. And that's the world I grew up in. I served on both types of submarines. And that's my my, my first submarine was the USS Daniel Boone 629, SSBN 629, which, believe it or not, was made the year I was born in 1966. Oh. Uh, and, and and so, well, let's put it that in perspective. So it was built in 1966 and I was serving on it in 1990. So that ship had been around for about 30 years. Mm -hmm. but it's a testament to the engineering and the capability of technology in the United States of America that that ship that was built then was actually still effective and, and valuable uh, 30 years later. Um, the other submarines that I served on, I served on three other submarines, mm -hmm. uh, were all fast attack submarines. I served on USS Montpelier, SSN 765, uh, I served on USS Hyman G. Rickover, which was SSN 709, and I actually commanded the USS Miami, which is SSN 755. Um, the one thing that's a little unique about me commanding a submarine was that in the history of the United States of America, I was only the eighth black man to do that. Uh, and uh, very proud of that and very proud of that heritage. Uh, the ones who came before me played a significant role and making that happen by being mentors to me. Uh, and uh, that was probably the best uh, job I've ever done in the <laughs> military. It was, uh, it was extremely challenging. It was a lot of fun. Uh, the, the, and talk a little bit about what that means. So when I commanded USS Miami, as I point out, it's a, it's a nuclear fast attack submarine. It's 365 feet long. It's about 33 feet wide. Mm -hmm. It had a nuclear reactor on it, 165 megawatts, if anybody wants to know. Uh, it carried uh, Tomahawk cruise missiles. It carried uh, torpedoes. Uh, I had a crew of about 150 men. And, we, and, and when I was there, we actually deployed uh, to the Gulf region okay. uh, during the time that we were still, we were winding down in Iraq, and we were still actually operating uh, pretty strongly in Afghanistan. So how many wars did you... Uh Fighting? Well, if you count the Cold War, I would, uh, well, if you count the Cold, well, since I've been actively commissioned in the military, we had Desert Storm, mm -hmm. uh, we had Iraqi Freedom, okay. we had Enduring Freedom, and then the Cold War for the first five years or so of my career okay. uh, until the USSR ceased to exist. And so uh, uh, I guess you would say I'm a veteran of those four wars. Okay, okay. And um, moving from you serving in those wars, um, have you lost men uh, while you was in those four wars? No, I've never lost men. Um, one of the things that's a little unique about being in a submarine, as opposed to you'll talk to some folks who served in the Army or the Air Force or the Marine Corps, where their primary function of service is on land mm -hmm. uh, and potentially in contact with the enemy. Uh, the, the modus operandi for a submarine or a ship or a carrier or, or things in the Navy is that we are at sea. Mm -hmm. So unless we engage in a naval battle, uh, it is rare for us to lose anyone underneath our command. Okay. Uh, we have not had any major 
naval battles uh, since I have been in the Navy, but we have supported the battles that have gone on land. Okay. For example, we have launched uh, cruise missiles uh, in support of forces that are fighting on land. Okay. We have conducted intelligence uh, and reconnaissance in support of troops that are working on land. And a big part of what submarines do is uh, along the lines of inte intelligence and reconnaissance collection. Okay. Why? Because we're able to be covert, we're able to stay submerged for very long periods of time, mm -hmm. we're able to configure our submarines to intercept everything from visual imagery to uh, electronic signals, uh, and we're able to deploy mines, we're able to deploy special forces. Uh, one of the things I did when I was in the Gulf, I uh, actually worked with a SEAL team uh, to deploy forces and we actually worked in consort uh, with uh, Saudi Arabian operations, okay. uh, special operations folks as well. So um, how many years did you spend um, serving for our country? 23 and a half years. 23 that and doesn't a half. count the academy time. Uh, <laughs> okay. that, that's, that's for the money. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. That, that's what the money gets. But if you add in, if to be all told, when I, you add four more years for the academy. Oh, okay. And now you're retired. I am retired. You are retired. Okay. When year did you retire? Uh, 2011. 2011. Uh, from there, how did you transition from, you know, serving, always be on, you know, knowing the knowledge that you have, serving for our country while you were, we was on sea, right? Right. Uh, now, converting from that life to now having, you know, do you have wife and kids? Do you I have do. I okay, have so now you have a wife and child. Well, I had them back then, too. Oh, okay, okay. So you <laughs> had them while you were serving as well. Yeah, but, you okay. know, the, the interesting piece about that is, uh, you know, one of the things I've come to appreciate is uh, how tough that was for her. I have four kids. Okay. Uh, that my wife had to do a lot of things on her own. Uh, because I was deployed or I was at sea, not necessarily deployed, but I was at sea and I wasn't at home. So she had to do everything. She had to be a mother and a father. Uh, she had to, you know, take the kids where they needed to be and she had to make sure that everything was good at home. And she often had to do that with me not being, not only not being around, but not being in communication, not even being able to pick up the phone or send an email. Uh, and uh, I give her great credit for her service there. But we're going to take a step back a little bit because in the Navy, the way it works is you have your tours of duty at sea, and then you have your tours of duty on land. Okay. And so we usually refer to the ones at sea as sea duty, and we refer to the ones on land as shore duty. Okay. Okay, so, and, and shore duties can take on a lot of different manifestations. One of my shore duties, I served back at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland as an instructor, what we call a company officer. Um, three of my shore duties were at the Pentagon. Uh, and I served at the Pentagon in a couple of different capacities. And, and we're going to work this all the way to like what I do now. Okay. Um, but uh, one of those, a couple of those jobs, I ended up working for a gentleman by the name of Michael Mullen. Uh, you may not recognize his name right off the top of your head, but he is the most recent chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Oh, okay, okay. When I uh, first started working for him, uh, he was not the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but he was a three-star admiral. And uh, I went to work for him as a deputy executive assistant, which was fundamentally one of his principal assistants who worked in his front office. So okay. I was a person who helped him execute his duties uh, in that job. Uh, he then became the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, uh, which is the second highest uh, ranking officer in the Navy. Okay. And I went with him there as well, and I worked as a special assistant. And uh, specifically, the things that I did there uh, were long range uh, strategy uh, 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 assessments and uh, providing him uh, ways of looking at the world, ways of dealing with uh, geopolitical issues, things of that nature. In between those shore duties, I went and commanded USS Miami, which we just talked about. And then I came back and I worked for him again uh, as special assistant and deputy executive assistant again. So uh, because of those jobs, I actually was exposed to some very 
uh, interesting things, some significant things. I was there when uh, he spoke out against uh, the uh, policy of don't ask, don't tell. I was uh, in the group of people who helped him to uh, assess whether or not that was still a valid policy to have in our military in 2010. Okay. Um, I was there when, after President Barack Obama uh, first became president in his first term, and we were looking at plussing up troops in Afghanistan. So the assessment of do we plus up troops, how many troops do we plus up, when do we plus them up, all those things um, I uh, actually had a chance to play a role in. Um, I uh, was his principal assistant with regards to preparing him to testify on the Hill uh, with regards to the budget. Mm -hmm. And in one of the cases in the uh, first term of uh, President Barack Obama, we actually renegotiated the START Treaty, which is the nuclear arms treaty, with Russia. Okay. So START II, as, as we refer to it, I was there for that, and I was there uh, as he testified on the Hill along with uh, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Uh, so very interesting and fascinating times that uh, I was exposed to uh, in those capacities. Now fast forward to now, so what do I do now? Mm -hmm. I work uh, as a principal assistant to the president and CEO of a company down in Annapolis called Telecommunication Systems Incorporated. Uh, the significance of this is that this uh, gentleman, the gentleman who started this company, who I now work for, uh, is also a Naval Academy grad. Okay. Uh, he started it from three people and he's grown into half a billion dollars revenue, uh, 1,500 people uh, with locations throughout the country and around the world. Okay. Um, and so a lot of what we do is communications, but there's kind of a commercial side and a government side. On the government side, we provide secure, reliable communications to the Marine Corps, to the, to the Army, to the Navy, to other armed forces around the world. Uh, on the commercial side, we're inside all the carriers that you know about, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, Cricket, Metro PCS. Um, and uh, we do everything from location-based services, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, the things inside the network that enable your phone to tell you where you are. Uh, to uh, applications. So if you're a Verizon guy, VZ Navigator, that's our application. We actually build that application. So what I do for him is that I work across multiple business units within the company, mm -hmm. across the entire enterprise, and I work strategy, and I work assessment of what's going on in the world, so you can kind of call that intel. Uh, and uh, I help him maintain his relationships. All the same things that I kind of learned when I worked for Admiral Mike Mullen, when he was the chairman and when he was the VCNO and when he was a deputy chief of naval operations before that. Okay, so, so from your time of serving um, all the way until now, you have seen the, the morality change of technology from you know, when they first started the submarines all the way until now and then what you're doing now with right. the safety and the security um, with the technology that's going now. Um, what do you think most significantly has changed or how do you react and adapt to the change of technology and even in the future as well? Well, that's a, that's a interesting question. Um, so uh, it makes you wonder how in the world uh, I bought my first car in 1987 <laughs> without a GPS, mm -hmm. uh, without a cell phone, without a computer. <laughs> um, and, you know, I reflect back on those days and I, I, I kind of, I, even though I lived it, even though I did that, I sometimes have to reflect back on, on and I'm, how in the world did I do that, you know, before all these things? I couldn't Google it. <laughs> I, I couldn't pick up the cell. It's not like I could, you know, I, I had to, you had to go get a map. You had to go to a pay phone or you had to call them before you left and you had to get a newspaper. I mean, that's kind of like how things have changed. So you go buy a car now, you go to CarMax or you Google, or you go to Trader, you know, autotrader.com and, and it's all there. It's got a phone number. You got a phone that you can actually put in your pocket and take with you. You got a GPS to show, show you where to go. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you get lost, you can just stop right there, pick up the phone and call right there. You don't have to look around for a pay phone. Mm -hmm. And the other part is have change for the pay phone. So 
how things have changed with regards to technology. Things are quicker. Uh, things are more transparent. Uh, that's a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, on one hand, it's good because you have access to a lot more information. Question is, who has access to the information and what do they do with it? Mm -hmm. uh, most recently, we have the issues with the National Security Agency and uh, uh, the concept of privacy, the, the concept of what, what is uh, beyond the bounds of what the government should be able to access with regards to people. Well, the problem is when you have a computer or you have a cell phone and it's connected to the uh, network, then it allows people to manipulate that network to access information. There is no such thing as, well, Privacy. I, got, I got my information here, and, but I connect, to, I connect to that network, but nobody can see my information, but I can see everything in the network. It's kind of a two-way street. Two -way street. Mm -hmm. and, and with regards to the military, uh, we've seen significant changes with regards to what the technology has enabled us to do. We now have uh, unmanned vehicles. And we have unmanned vehicles in the air that we call drones, drones. and we have unmanned vehicles underneath the water that we call UUVs. Okay. Um, we have uh, better computing technology. I mean, uh, the, the instrumentation or the equipment on board my first submarine, uh, I, I, I think my iPhone is more powerful than the computing technology on those submarines. And you got to remember that first submarine was capable of shooting nuclear missiles. Mm -hmm. So it's... Um, it's been uh, it's, a, it's staggering how much technology has improved. What has happened is size, weight, and power have all been manipulated to be more advantageous for ships, for airplanes, for people who you know, for soldiers who have to move all this equipment. Everybody says, okay, yeah, the army's going to go here, the army's going to go there. The army has to communicate, and when they move they got to move all the equipment with them. Well, they want the size to be as small as possible. They want the weight to be as low as possible, and they want the power. They want the power to consume the least amount possible with regards to uh, their ability to use that equipment. Okay. Um, and, and, again, I know you have uh, served with great honors, and you're still in a position of a high authority and power. Um, where do you see yourself uh, in the next five to ten years? Well, that's a good question. Um, right now, I'm pretty much focused on my kids. Uh, as I pointed out earlier, because of my uh, duty, uh, because of my service, uh, oftentimes I wasn't here uh, in their lives. And so now that I'm here all the time, I'm more focused on the day-to-day -day things that they need to be involved in, everything from their academics to their extracurricular activities. I'm more focused on my oldest son, who is now a sophomore in high school, and preparing him to uh, go to college. All right. uh, I have a set of twins two years after him, and then I have uh, one more two years after them. So uh, it's going to be a pretty, the next five years, I'm going to see uh, three of my children enter college. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of where I'm most focused. Uh, I, I think I... God willing, I'll still be at Telecommunication Systems, okay. uh, which is the name of my company, uh, and uh, doing good work uh, for them. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, once I get things settled with the kids and I get things settled professionally, hopefully uh, uh, find things to do in the community to find a way to give back. So what was your recollections of 9-11? Uh, I remember the day uh, very vividly. Um, my submarine was, uh, at that time I was the executive officer or the second in command on USS Hyman G. Rickover. And our submarine was preparing to deploy and we were actually at uh, submarine headquarters. This was down in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, and we were headed over for an intel briefing. And as we were waiting to go into the intel briefing, uh, they had a TV that was playing uh, the news. And uh, we looked up and uh, we saw, you know, we were like trying to figure out what they were showing that the volume was turned down. So it wasn't clear at the time what they were showing, but it was like showing this thing. And then all of a sudden we saw the plane hit the building. And I mean, it just like, what in the world was that? And uh, uh, quickly uh, it, the, the word started to kind of bubble up at uh, headquarters. And uh, uh, 
needless to say, the intel briefing was canceled and we were directed to return immediately to the submarine and prepare to get underway. Mm -hmm. Because at that time we weren't sure of the extent of the attacks and if there were other attacks planned, uh, things of that nature, and just lesson learned from World War II, right? Mm -hmm. and you leave all your ships tied up in port, you know, uh, you might lose them all. So it's best to get them underway and get them out to sea where they can stand a chance of being safer. So. Uh, the captain and I uh, set out to return from headquarters back to our ship, which was literally less than a quarter of a mile away, and the traffic was unreal. In, w in a quarter of a mile, we could not move. We ended up parking the car on the side of the road and walking uh, the rest of the way back to the pier, to oh, our wow. ship, and uh, you know, gave orders to immediately prepare the ship to get underway. For a nuclear submarine, that's not like you go in and turn the key and it, vroom, 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 you, this one, you know, <laughs> and that's um, unfortunately that's one of the drawbacks. It, it takes some time to actually start a reactor. Uh, and uh, this is, we're talking on the order of hours. So, uh, and then on top of that, not everybody was on the ship, so we had to do an emergency recall of people to get them back to the ship. We didn't know how much food we had on board. <laughs> you know, I oh, mean, it's wow. like all these things because we weren't preparing Prepared. to get underway that day. Um, and, uh, you know, so some things that kind of came out of that was an increase in uh, what we call anti-terrorism force protection. Okay. Uh, things, rules changed with regards to how, where you could park and how you could park and the concept of having guards topside. Uh, you had to maintain a, a certain amount of food on board at all time uh, in case you had to get underway. Uh, and in this particular case, what happened is we did not get underway that day, but uh, we were uh, in a state of readiness that we could get underway within six hours if directed. Okay. Uh, within that, now you say you all wasn't prepared. Do you think that now, in case something like this happened again? Well, like I said, you know, things have changed mm -hmm. uh, since then. And so from that standpoint, uh, our readiness posture uh, to be responsive and to understand that there could be attacks against the homeland, that it's not just always overseas, it's completely changed uh, the mindset and the, and the world, we, the way we look at things. So um, thank you, Mr. Richard Bryan, um, for having this interview with us today. Um, we greatly appreciate it, and we feel to see you again, okay? All right, I do appreciate thank you, it. Sir. Thank you.